Pell Mell Famous Cigarettes presents The Big Story. You ready, Mama? Is the store locked? Just closing the back door. You're finished, Joe? Busy week, good week. And the money? In the valise, ready for deposit first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. Oh, a customer. It's too late. No, it's not too late. Maybe he needs something. Wait, wait. Oh, it's two customers, Sal. Two men. Two is better than one. Come in, gentlemen. Come in. What can I... You're an old guy, Pop. I wouldn't want to hurt you. But if I had to, I would. You want to... The valise, Pop. The valise. No, I... But sorry, you're not rich. Frank, maybe he doesn't understand polite talk. Now, give me that valise. Frank, talk to the man so he'll be sure and understand. The Big Story. Here is America. Its sound and its fury, its joy and its sorrow, as faithfully reported by the men and women of the great American newspapers. Cleveland, Ohio. From the pages of the Cleveland, Ohio press, the moving story of justice and a guy named Joe. Tonight, to William Miller of the Cleveland, Ohio press, goes the Pell Mell Award for the big story. Four notes that are alike, and one that is outstanding. And of America's leading cigarettes, one is outstanding. The longer, finer cigarette in the distinguished red package, Pell Mell. Ladies and gentlemen, have you noticed how many of your friends have changed to Pell Mell? There's a reason. Pell Mell famous cigarettes... Good to look at. Good to feel. Good to taste. And good to smoke. Yes, there's one cigarette that's really different, really outstanding... Pell-Mell. For Pell-Mell's greater length of traditionally fine, mellow tobaccos filters the smoke of this longer, finer cigarette. Gives you that smoothness, mildness, and satisfaction no other cigarette offers you. Four notes that are alike and one that is outstanding. And of America's leading cigarettes, one is outstanding. Pell Mell famous cigarettes, outstanding. And they are mild. Now the story as it actually happened. William Miller's story as he lived it. Cleveland, Ohio. You sit at your desk, William Miller of the Cleveland Press, writing the story of a brutal holdup. A man and a woman, both in their 60s, owners of a small dry goods store on East 102nd Street, have been beaten and robbed. The sum taken, $2,000, represents 10 years' savings for their kind of people. Their attackers were kids, 119, 121, to whom money is the final goal and to whom a storekeeper and his wife are just two people in the way. You write that bitter news story, and two months later you write with satisfaction that one of the robbers was sentenced to 15 years in jail. The other robber was never picked up, but you're happy with the one they got. You enter his name in the back of your mind under the category Louse. Joe Mantell, Louse. That done... You forget about him. Until four months later, the phone on your desk jogs you back into remembrance. Miller speaking. Receptionist, Mr. Miller. There's an old woman out here to see you. Well, who is she? What does she want? Wouldn't say. Ask her name. I'm busy. Yes, sir. What is your name? Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Mantell, Mr. Miller. Mantell? I don't know any. Oh, Joe Mantell. She anything to do with him? His mother, Mr. Miller. What do you know? Yeah, send her in. I'd like to hear what she's got to say. Yeah, send her in. Yeah, 
You're very kind to see me, Mr. Miller. You read the stories I wrote on your son, didn't you, Mrs. Mantell? Yes, I did. Well, then you know just how I feel. I'm only sorry you didn't get 25 years. I'm not a proud woman, Mr. Miller. If, to get to the truth, I have to scrub floors or take a little insult. A mother doesn't mind that, Mr. Miller. Now, look. Now, what do you got to say? Joey didn't do it any more than I did. The jury thought otherwise. Joey wasn't there. He wasn't near the store that night. Yeah, you said that in court. I know I did. Well, what do you want anyhow? A man gets a trial, a fair trial, a jury of decent, honest people find him guilty. What more do you want? Mr. Miller, I'm a reader of your paper of 15 years. I like the way you write. I know all that. No, Thank that's you not much. flattery. It's the truth. You remember the Sullivan boy about eight years ago, Mr. Miller? He was found guilty by a jury of honest people, too, but you wrote about it and... You helped prove that he was innocent. And the Ginsburg girl, that was about four years look, ago. Look, look, I, I, I studied your son's case. The only thing that makes me sore was that they didn't catch the other crook and your son only got 15 years. Those people were in their 60s, Mrs. Mantell. I'm 67, Mr. Miller. At 67, a woman don't lie. My boy was home in the garage fixing the car. Well, why was he fixing a car in the evening? Because when a boy wants to make a new start, he don't care if it's afternoon or evening. Meaning what? Joseph Mantell, my son, was a bad boy. And it's a mother saying that, Mr. Miller. When he was 16, he stole a car. At 18, he robbed a candy store. So, of course, any jury would say that at 19, he'd... Hold up another store and steal $2,000. And beat up the storekeeper and his wife. I'd say the same thing. You see, the night of the robbery, he was going away. I got $300 together, all I could spare. You see, my husband is dead. And we bought Joey a second-hand car, and he was going away. I was sitting on the steps that night, and he was in the garage fixing the car. What's California like, Ma? Oh, it's nice, Joey. A boy could, well, he could find himself there. Ah, uh, you don't know me, Ma. I got two strikes against me. If he tries hard, he could find himself. Ma, sometimes I think when they handed out luck, I was out for a beer. Now, don't make smart jokes, Joey. <laughs> okay. They must have seen you coming when they sold you this jalopy. It'll get you to California, and that's all I want. Look, Joey, people in California never heard of you. No, I know. No, it's not so easy. Cops heard of me, Ma. And other kinds of people, too. Don't kid yourself. But you got nothing to be ashamed of. You did your time for the wrong things that you did. You'll go there and make a new star. Yeah, yeah, sure. Who knows? Maybe I'll be the next Van Johnson. <laughs> Joe Mantell in Home on a Range, playing at your... What is it, Joey? Okay, Mantell. Come along. What's the matter... Officer, what's happened? Didn't he tell you? No. You'll find out. Let's go. The sergeant is waiting for you, man. Tell. And the judge and the jury. And I think there'll be a nice, comfortable cell, too. Now, come on. That's the God's truth, Mr. Miller. He was going away to turn over a new leaf, too. Okay, Mrs. Mantell, I heard you. Now, if you'll excuse me, I got a lot of work to do. Three witnesses saw him. Maybe Joey was right. Two strikes against you, he said. Chances are you strike out. Yeah, I'm sorry. Take that door out, will you, Mrs. Mantell? I'm not a charitable institution, and I'm not a dope either. And that's all. You close your mind to it. Happens every day. Every crook with a mother is innocent. You go back to the real world of being an honest reporter, and then something happens. And you realize that you haven't shaken the Mantell case from your mind because... You write this story, Smitty? Yeah, why? About the two guys that held up the gas station? Told you I did. Something the matter? Oh, no, nothing. Just... Well, did you see the crooks? Sure I saw them. Hey, what's eating you? Just this. The two criminals, Bud and Frank Enright, 19 and 21... In addition to robbing the attendant, beat him cruelly as well. The injuries may prove fatal because the attendant was a man well in his 60s. So? Well, nothing. It just, just reminds me of another case. I just wonder if 
Nah, three witnesses couldn't be wrong. The jury couldn't be that wrong. Nah. Or, or could they? Hey, Smitty, what jail are those two crooks in? <laughs> Sergeant, can I see this, uh, Bud Enright? Ah, uh, sure. It's a free country. What's the point, Miller? Well, I just... Just that I want to make sure I didn't insult an old lady. Huh? I don't know what you're talking about, but go ahead. Go as far as you like. Only leave him in the cooler, will you? You look like him. You know that, don't you? Like who? Like Joe Mantell. Who's he? The boy who was set up for beating and robbing a couple who ran a dry goods store on East 102nd Street six months ago. So what? I look like him. Did you do that job? Don't be stupid. Now, look, bud, you're in a bad way. You may get life. You know that, don't you? Look, get out of here. I got a right to be alone. You and your brother stuck up that couple, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, we stuck him up and tipped the cops to pick up this man's tell. Now, what do you got to lose? Tell the truth. Maybe an innocent kid is up for 15 years for what you did. My heart's bleeding. Now get out of here and leave me alone. What kind of jail is this anyhow? Anybody can come in here say anything he wants. Leave me alone. Mr. Jenkins, you identified this man as the robber of the dry goods store. Look, young man, I testified to that effect in court. I don't see and why... And this I... is the man, isn't it? This is his picture? That's right. Now, if you don't mind, this I... This is not Joe Mantell. What? That's right. This is Bud Enright, not Joe Mantell. But I... Then you're not sure it was Mantell who held up that store. It might have been this man. Uh, yes, sir. Thanks. That's all I wanted to know. <laughs> Is this the man, Mrs. Smothers? This one? Oh, it certainly is. I'd know his face anywhere. He came in our store just... Well, this is not the man your testimony convicted, Mrs. Smothers. This is another man. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness, that's terrible. You're sure? I told you I didn't do it, Miller. When are you going to leave me alone? Enright, I've got affidavits from three witnesses saying you were the man, not Mantell. From the storekeepers, too. Now, why don't you stop it? You're going to get life anyhow. Play ball. Maybe something can be done. I don't want any part of it. Now, look, may may maybe it's a stupid thing to say, Enright, but how about a little thing like your conscience? Uh, how about a little thing like that fact that this kid's mother is sick to death because... Enright, I swear I'm going to haunt you till you tell me the truth. I'm going to... All right. All right, shut up. I got a statement right here. I'll read it. And read it carefully. Okay, let me see it. Well, there it is, Commissioner. The works. Signed confession by Enright, affidavits of error by the witnesses, and now all you have to do is see the governor. Suppose we go slow, Miller. What do you mean, slow? Everything's right here in front of you, Commissioner. Sure, sure. What is the confession of a life term of worth? What did you offer him to sign? A sympathetic treatment in your paper? No. Feed a little sentiment to most crooks, they'll oblige you. What have they got to lose? That confession isn't worth the paper it's written on. What about the affidavits of the witnesses? What, what about Mrs. Smothers, who owned the store? What? That they made a mistake? That they said Enright was Mantel? I could get them to say Mantel was Enright, or maybe somebody else. Maybe instead of making one mistake, they're making two mistakes. What proof have you got? Real proof. Absolute proof that would warrant our reversing a jury. But this man is innocent, Commissioner. I know, I know. An innocent man is in prison. Makes a great story. But how does this one strike you? A guilty man is pardoned. How do you like that story? Mantell didn't do it. He was fixing his car that night. He was going to California. A jury thought otherwise. Twelve honest men and women, as honest as you or I, they thought otherwise. You think you've got enough to throw that decision away? Well, look, in the Sullivan case, in the Ginsburg oh, case... Oh, sure. You batted a thousand there. Only this time you might be batting zero. Nothing you've shown me would make the governor give Mantell a pardon. Nothing. 
I want proof, Miller, proof. Maybe this will sound high-handed to you, but it happens to be my philosophy, and the philosophy of the courts of this country. A jury has the last word. Trial by jury is the pillar of decency and law. You don't throw that over for a whim or an idea or even because a smart reporter comes in and presents you with something that indicates maybe, just maybe, something is wrong. Think that over, Miller. But any time you want to speak to me again, come right in. I'm honest, but I'm hard-headed. You'll be the same. <laughs> We'll be back in just a moment with tonight's big story, but first a word from Cy Harris. Ladies and gentlemen, have you noticed how many of your friends have changed to Pell-Mell? There's a reason. Pell-Mell famous cigarettes... Good to look at. Good to feel. Good to taste. And good to smoke. Yes, there's one cigarette that's really different, really outstanding. Pell-Mell. When you pick up a Pell-Mell, you can see the difference, you can feel the difference. And when you smoke a Pell-Mell, you can taste the difference. For Pell-Mell's greater length of traditionally fine, mellow tobaccos filters the smoke of this longer, finer cigarette. Gives you that smoothness, mildness, and satisfaction no other cigarette offers you. Four notes that are alike, and one that is outstanding. And of America's leading cigarettes, one is outstanding. The longer, finer cigarette in the distinguished red package. Pell-Mell famous cigarettes. Outstanding. And they are mild. Now, back to your narrator, Bob Sloan, and the big story of William Miller as he lived it and wrote it. You walk out of the commissioner's office, slowly weighing his words, because you're just a reporter, Bill Miller, a reporter for the Cleveland Press. You think over what he said, that courts and trial by jury are the pillars of our society. And you know he has a point, a big point. And so, as you move ahead now, you look for proof, proof that'll be important enough to reverse a decision by a jury of 12 men and women, tried and true. Your first step is taken with a specialist, Dr. Thompson, an expert with a lie detector. You two sit down with Joe Mantel, and as the doctor gives him a test for truth, you can hear his heartbeat. Now, just relax, Mr. Mantel, if you please, and answer the questions I'll ask you. Yes. Yes, sir. Are you innocent? Yes, sir, doctor, I am. Where were you on the night of the robbery? Fixing my car. What kind of car was it? A Chevy. Convertible. How many times were you convicted before? Twice. Both times for robbery. But this time you're innocent. Yes, sir, I'm innocent. I never... Very well. Mrs. Smothers, the storekeeper, said you hit her husband on the head. That's a lie. I never did. I... I wouldn't hit a man old enough to be my father. All right, Mr. Mantell. That'll do. That'll do very nicely. Oh, just sit still, Enright. This is a lie detector. I signed your statement, didn't I? What are you going to bother me with all this for? Just answer the questions and nothing's going to happen to you. All right, Mr. Miller, I'm ready. Now, Mr. Enright, describe what happened when you went into the store. I walked in, me and my brother. I wouldn't hand over the money, so I took it. I had it in a little valise. And then you hit him. Frank hit him. We wanted to be sure they wouldn't call the cops. And then you walked out? Yeah, we put out the lights and then walked out. How much money was in the valise? Two thousand bucks. Ain't that enough. Your brother says you hit him. And he's a liar. A dirty liar. All right, Mr. Enright. Fine. Thank you. Now, do me a favor, Miller. Get that man tell punk out of jail and leave me alone. I'll try, bud. I'll try. The tests, Commissioner, establish, in my judgment, the innocence of Joseph Mantell and demonstrate that Bud Enright was telling the truth when he admitted the robbery. I see. Well, what do you say, Commissioner? 
Lie detectors are funny things. Tell me, Doctor, how do you explain this chart? The wild beatings and vibrations during Mantell's testimony. If he was telling the truth. Well, he's young and excitable. And anyone would have such reaction. Then they're not conclusive. He might have had the same reactions if he were lying. Well, uh, Commissioner Enright's charge shows that he wasn't lying. Now, to me, it doesn't. Well, why doesn't it? Because, check me on this, Doctor, the lie detector breaks down when it comes to hardened criminals. I mean, a man with a record who over a period of years has built himself up to lie evenly. Such a man could fool a lie detector, right? Well, there would be some difficulty in such a case. Read Enright's record, Miller. Seven major crimes in six years. Everything from smuggling to assault to arson to robbery. Such a man is constitutionally unable to distinguish between right and wrong. But for heaven's sake, Commissioner... I still see a jury of 12 people deliberating in a closed room, settling the fate of a man. I don't see this kind of half evidence changing what went on in that room. Well, what do you want? I want a reason. A better reason than you've given me for reversing a jury. <laughs> You write articles in your paper, Bill Miller. Articles pointing out the validity of your case. You call upon outstanding citizens to rally around the innocence of Joe Mantell. You bring support to your case in the person of the most respectable citizens of Cleveland. And then you go to see the commissioner once more. No, I won't change my mind. Well, you... Now, look, this has gone beyond the stage of reasonable doubt. Here are the names of 200 of the most prominent citizens of Cleveland. I was just as impressed with the names of the witnesses and the storekeeper's wife. Size doesn't change this. And the importance of the people who signed doesn't change it. They didn't sit on that jury. They didn't hear all the evidence. Well, suppose I got the jurors themselves. Would that change your mind? Sure How could you do that? That jury was impaneled over a year ago. A lot of those people are... Who knows? All over the state, maybe some out of the state. How could you get them? Well, suppose I did. What, what would you say then? You really believe in this, don't you? Just as much as you believe in the sanctity of the courts. If you'll get the jury, Miller, I'll get you some action from the governor. <laughs> Now you've said something, Bill Miller. You're going to get the jury to reverse themselves. And in saying it, you've said a mouthful. Because just as the commissioner thought, half the jurors can't be located easily. Some have moved to other cities, some to other states. But you go after them. You reach them wherever they are and present the testimony of the witnesses. You show them the photos. You bring in the lie detector tests. And finally, after a year of hard work, You've got 11 jurors agreeing that Joe Mantell should be pardoned. But 11 isn't 12. And the 12th juror, Mrs. Anna Ryder, can't be found anywhere. And then your phone rings. Miller speaking. Mr. Miller, this is Mrs. Mantell. Oh, uh, hello, Mrs. Mantell. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. And I, I, I haven't had a chance yet to tell you how much I appreciate all that you've done. Oh, it's and all I... right, Mrs. Mantell. I wish I... You know, I haven't been able to finish what I started. Yes, I know, I, I know. M Mrs. Ryder, the 12th juror... Yeah, we can't find her anywhere. But that's why why I called you. I found yeah, her. Yeah, we've done every... You found her? Well, where? Well, that's just it, Mr. Miller. She's very sick and, and, and she's in the hospital. Well, could we see her? Well, I don't know. The, the doctor says her condition is very serious. Well, give me the name of the hospital. Maybe we can do it, Mrs. Mantell. Maybe we can. And that's the story, Mrs. Ryder. Thank you for coming. You see, I'm dying, Mr. Miller. Oh, no, you're not. Oh, yes, I know. But I thank you for coming. Always since I saw your first articles in the paper months ago, always there was a little cloud of doubt in my mind. And if I died with such a thing on my conscience... Oh, no, you mustn't talk. No. No, you see, his mother... This innocent boy's mother, she might have been me. Uh, no. No, Mr. Miller, I thank you for coming. You have a paper for me to sign? Give me the paper and bless you. Bless you for coming. Hi, 
I'm so glad you came, Mr. Miller. Joey is so happy since he was pardoned by the governor. Well, I'm glad too, Mrs. Mantell. It's a very nice party. Yes, it's a, it's a coming home party and a going away party too. Did did you have some turkey? Yes, thank you. I did. Uh, what, what do you mean going away? You haven't seen Joey, have you? No, I was beginning to wonder where. Well, he's out in the back in the garage fixing up the car. He said he don't want a party. He just wants to go away. He's changed, Mr. Miller, thanks to you. No chip on his shoulder now. No two strikes against him. Go out, Mr. Miller. Shake his hand and wish him luck. Joey would like that better than anything in the world. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll read you a telegram from William Miller of the Cleveland Press with the final outcome of tonight's big story. The cigarette that's really different. The longer, finer cigarette that's really outstanding. Pell Mell famous cigarettes. Good to look at. Good to feel. Good to taste. And good to smoke. Yes, Pell Mells are good to look at, good to feel, good to taste, and good to smoke. Four notes that are alike, and one that is outstanding. And of America's leading cigarettes, one is outstanding. The longer, finer cigarette in the distinguished red package, Pell Mell. Pell Mell Famous Cigarettes. Outstanding. And they are mild. Now we read you that telegram from William Miller of the Cleveland, Ohio Press. Couldn't write the story of my meeting that day with Mantell. A little too personal, a little too private. But could tell that by way he said, hi, useful life had been reclaimed. Feeling was justified when two years later received postcard from Mantell in California. He was happy, had a good job, doing well. Many thanks for tonight's Pell Mell Award. Thank you, Mr. Miller. The makers of Pell Mell famous cigarettes are proud to have named you the winner of the Pell Mell $500 Award for notable service in the field of journalism. Listen again next week, same time, same station, when Pell Mell famous cigarettes will present another big story. A big story from the front pages of the Indianapolis Star. Byline, Robert Early. A big story about racing cars, reckless men, and a driver who gambled and lost. Big Story is produced by Bernard J. Proctor with music by Vladimir Selinsky. Tonight's program was written by Arnold Pearl. Your narrator was Bob Sloan and Arnold Moss played the part of William Miller. In order to protect the names of people actually involved in tonight's authentic Big Story, the names of all characters in the dramatization were changed with the exception of the reporter, Mr. Miller. This is Ernest Chappell speaking for the makers of Pell Mell Famous Cigarettes. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.